The ASUS TUF A16 is a new all-AMD gaming laptop. They've ditched the A15s in video graphics for Radeon, making this one of the few AMD Advantage laptops that you'll see this year. The A16 is available with two different finishes, Off Black, which I've got, and Sandstorm. The smooth matte black metal lid just has a subtle TUF logo on the top corner. The plastic interior is all black too, with a small TUF logo on the touchpad. Fingerprints show up, more so on the interior than the lid, but it's not too bad and it's easy to clean. There's not much keyboard flex at all, it feels quite sturdy. There's a little flex to the metal lid, but again it feels fine and the hinges feel nice and smooth to open, with only extremely minor screen wobble when typing hard. There's a part on the front that sticks out, making it easy to open up with one finger. There aren't any sharp corners or edges, overall it feels well built. It's slightly larger in all dimensions compared to last year's smaller TUF A15, so the bigger 16 inch screen doesn't come for nothing. The laptop alone weighs under 2.2 kilos or 4.8 pounds, increasing to 2.9 kilos or 6.5 pounds with the 240 watt charger included. My TUF has AMD's Ryzen 7 7735HS processor, AMD's Radeon RX 7600S graphics, 16 gigs of memory, and a 16 inch 165Hz screen. Ryzen 7000 processor. That's the latest AMD CPU, right? Not quite, as the 3 in 7735HS means that this is a Zen 3 Plus part, the same architecture as last year's Ryzen 6000 series. If we look at the specs of the 7735HS side by side with the 6800H, a popular AMD processor in gaming laptops last year, well, they look almost the same, except that the 7735HS has a 50 megahertz higher maximum boost clock. In every practical sense, the 7735HS in this laptop is basically a 6800H. The TUF A16 will also be available with AMD's Ryzen 9 7940HS, which is based on the newer Zen 4 architecture, but that's launching a bit later. There's a 720p camera above the screen, but it does not have IR for Windows Hello Face Unlock. Here's how the camera and microphones look and sound, and this is what it sounds like while typing on the keyboard. The chiclet keyboard only has one zone of white backlighting, no RGB here, but it lights up all keys and secondary functions. Key brightness can be adjusted between three levels or turned off with the F2 and F3 shortcuts, while the aura key next to it cycles through the three available effects, static, breathing, and strobing. The keyboard has 1.7 millimeters of key travel, and I like typing on it more compared to the recent Blade 18. There's just a more tactile feel here. The touchpad feels good too, it's nice and smooth and it feels nice and accurate to click with. The left side has an air exhaust vent, the power input, gigabit ethernet port facing the preferred way, HDMI 2.1 output, two type C ports, the one closer to the back is USB 4 while the one closer to the front is USB 3.2 gen 2. The USB type A port is slower 3.2 gen 1 and there's an audio combo jack. The right just has a second USB 3.2 gen 1 type a port, an air exhaust on this side too, and Kensington lock up the back. Most of the ports are on the left to keep cables out of the way of your mouse hand. RIP left handers. No ports on the back. The Type-C port closest to the front can be used to charge the laptop with up to 100 watts. I tried to connect an external GPU to the Thunderbolt 4 port, but it wasn't recognized. Both Type-C ports also have DisplayPort 1.4 support, but only the one closer to the back connects directly to the discrete graphics, but it does this whether Optimus is on or off. The front Type-C port always goes to the integrated graphics. HDMI always connects directly to the discrete graphics, and we confirmed it can run a 4K screen at 120Hz 12-bit with G-Sync. Getting inside requires unscrewing 12 Phillips head screws. They're different sizes, so keep track of them. It's not hard to open, but you definitely need some good pry tools due to the front of the bottom panel not being straight. The ones I use are linked below the video. Once inside, we've got the battery 
battery down the front, two memory slots near the middle, the included SSD in the left M.2 slot, a spare secondary M.2 slot on the right, and the Wi-Fi 6 card is hiding underneath the installed SSD. Wi-Fi speed wasn't quite as fast as many other laptops that use Intel Wi-Fi, but it was a little ahead of last year's Tough A15, which used the same MediaTek card, and you could upgrade this for like $20. The speeds from the 512 gig drive that came installed were pretty good. The upgradeability score was the same as last year's TOF. We can upgrade two memory slots, fit two PCIe Gen 4 M.2 SSDs with chips on both sides, and swap Wi-Fi. Half a point was taken off from ease of access like last year too, as the front of the bottom panel doesn't run across in a straight line, so the angles made it a bit trickier to run a pry tool through. The speakers are fine but not great. There's only a little bass and they sounded tinny at higher volume levels. The latency mon results weren't too bad. The Tough A16 is powered by a 4 cell 90 watt hour battery. Panel power saver is enabled by default in the Armory Crate software. This lowers the screen's refresh rate down to 60 hertz when you unplug the charger to help save battery. It automatically reverses this when you plug back in, which is why the screen goes black. We can also change the GPU to eco mode if smart access graphics is not enabled. More on that soon. This disables the more power hungry 7600S graphics to help improve battery life that I tested in standard mode. It lasted for over 10 hours in my YouTube video playback test. An excellent result. And only a little behind last year's Tough A15. This is the first Tough with Radeon graphics though, which might explain why the runtime in a game was quite a bit lower. Let's check out thermal next. We've got two fans with heat pipes shared between the CPU and GPU with thermal paste. The ASUS website shows a newer cooler design with six heat pipes, but mine doesn't have that. It seems to be the same cooler as last year, so it might be that only the higher tier RX 7700S or Zen 4 options get that. Air comes in through the vent above the keyboard and through the holes in the bottom panel, some of which are directly above the intake fans, and air gets exhausted out of both the left and right sides, as well as out the back. ASUS's Armory Crate software allows us to change between different performance modes, which from lowest to highest are silent, performance, turbo, and manual. Manual is the only one that gives us customization. We can change the fan curves and adjust CPU or CPU plus GPU power limits. The internal temperatures were cool when just sitting there idle. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU stress tests, which aim to represent a worst case full load scenario. CPU thermal throttling was happening at 95 degrees Celsius in performance, turbo, and even manual mode with the fans maxed out. It's worth remembering that my A16 has the Zen 3 Plus CPU. It's possible that the more efficient Zen 4 option could do better. The cooling pad I test with, linked below the video, was able to lower the GPU temp by almost 12 degrees, but only because its performance lowers. More on that shortly. The GPU was definitely running the warmest with the lid closed to represent a docked scenario. These are the clock speeds being reached during the same stress tests. The CPU clock speeds were much higher in manual mode with the cooling pad. However, the GPU clock wasn't as high. This is why the GPU temperature lowered so much. It seems that the thermal headroom of adding a cooling pad made it prioritize CPU performance. We can see this when looking at the power levels being reached. The CPU was running around 40 6 watts with the cooling pad, but the GPU drops back from 90 plus to around 74. Having the CPU thermal throttle with the fan maxed out at 29 watts isn't super impressive. We can't fairly compare the GPU power to Nvidia though, because as we'll see in some games soon, the 7600S was often beating RTX 3060 laptops with 130 plus watt limits. The ASUS website mentions up to a 120 watt TGP with smart shift, but this clearly refers to the platform SPPT option in manual mode, which says it includes both the CPU and GPU, because we never found the GPU to go above 95 watts. It also explains why in the stress tests, the CPU was around 30 watts and GPU around 90, which is 120 combined. Here's how an actual game performs with the different modes in use. Silent mode didn't end up performing that much worse compared to the higher performing modes. The CPU was able to run higher when the GPU wasn't active, like in 
and Cinebench. Thermal throttling was still happening, but not until the CPU was running at around 64 watts. The score is pretty much the same in manual and turbo modes. As you'll hear soon, the fans weren't actually any faster in manual mode. Remember, the 7735HS is essentially a 6800H. It's still a Zen 3 Plus part and not AMD's newer Zen 4 architecture. Last year's tough A15 with 6800H was only scoring 3% higher, while most Intel options were able to score significantly higher as they've got more cores and threads. Performance lowers if we unplug the charger and instead run purely off of battery power. And although it's now ahead of a number of Intel laptops that were previously faster, it's still not quite as good as last year's tough A15 with the 6800H. Most laptops I test are in the low 30 degree Celsius range on the keyboard at idle, and the A16 was right around this. The middle of the keyboard gets fairly warm in the center with silent mode, but the fans are still quiet. Performance mode was cooler, but the trade-off is louder fans. Turbo mode was a bit warmer, but it's not hot. Well, right at the back was, but you don't need to touch there. Manual mode was much the same, peaking in the mid 40s in the center. So again, warm, but not hot, and WASD was fine. But let's hear how loud the fans are. The fans were completely silent at idle, I couldn't hear them. Stress tests in silent mode weren't that loud, while performance, turbo, and manual were all about the same, maxing out at 49 decibels, which is on the quieter side for a gaming laptop. For some context, out of 160 laptops I've measured fan noise for, the A16 was quieter than 139 of them, and most of the quieter ones are much lower powered Ultrabook designs. Given we had some CPU thermal throttling, this makes me wonder if manual mode with the fan set to maximum was actually running at maximum. Though ASUS does note that the fans on the A16 max out at 48 decibels, which is pretty close to what I got, so they might have chosen to sacrifice thermals for a quieter machine. Performance in games is still pretty good anyway. But before we look at that, we need to check out the screen. It's 16 by 10 in the new A16, so more pixels vertically compared to the A15. My tough A16 has a 1920 by 1200 165 hertz screen, but there's also a 2560 by 1600 240 hertz option. It's got FreeSync Premium with a 58 to 165 hertz range, but with low frame rate compensation. So if FPS dips below 58, games still appear smooth. The color gamut isn't anything amazing, but it's okay for a gaming laptop. Contrast is good, but it doesn't get super bright. 300 nits is the minimum I want to see, and it's basically right on this at full brightness. Average greater gray response time was measured at 7 milliseconds, exactly what ASUS advertise it with. But it's not quite the 6.06 .06 milliseconds needed for transitions to occur within the 165Hz refresh window. It's way faster compared to the 1080p 144Hz panel in last year's tough A15, and even slightly ahead of the more expensive 1080p 240Hz panel from the year before. There's no overdrive mode available, which I suspect suspect is why it's not quite as fast as others like the Legion 5 or IdeaPad. The total system latency is the amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fire appears on the screen in CSGO. Again, others like the Legion 5 were faster, helped out in part by the faster screen, but it's still faster compared to older versions of the TUF with Nvidia graphics. Backlight bleed was only minor, less compared to the more expensive SCAR 18 I recently tested at least. But this will vary between panels. This is the first laptop I've had featuring smart access graphics, which is basically AMD's version of Advanced Optimus. There's a normal MUX switch, which we can use to disable the integrated graphics by changing the GPU mode to Ultimate in Armory Crate, but that needs a reboot. Standard mode is like Optimus on, so both integrated and discrete graphics are available like normal. Eco mode disables the discrete graphics to help improve 
of battery life, while optimized mode sounds like it's the advanced Optimus option, but I didn't find it to work. There's this AMD smart graphic option just below it, which requires a reboot to turn on or off. If you've got this enabled and go into the Radeon software, in the graphics tab you can set hybrid graphics mode, which is basically Optimus on, or smart graphics, which is basically advanced Optimus, where the laptop will automatically change between integrated or discrete graphics based on what you open. The screen freezes for a few seconds if you open a GPU heavy workload like a game, just like advanced Optimus, and the integrated graphics are not used, which means better FPS in games. It actually actually blue screened while I was recording the demo, right after closing a GPU workload and it swapped from DGPU to iGPU. That's the only problem we had throughout all of the testing though. It was stable during the rest of our testing, and it's worth noting that Nvidia's advanced Optimus certainly wasn't perfect when it launched either. But Nvidia does also have more resources and market share, so it makes me wonder how Smart Access Graphics is going to compete. Anyway, Smart Access Graphics does work. My main problem was that the interface was just a bit confusing, though this may be more due to ASUS than AMD. I'm guessing when you click the optimize option in Armory Crate that it's meant to change that option in the Radeon software so that you don't have to also go into the Radeon software. Hopefully they either fix that in an update or otherwise make the process a bit clearer to understand. Alright, what you've all been waiting for. Let's find out how well the 7600S performs in games and see how well it compares against other laptops. Cyberpunk 20 77 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got the tough A16 shown by the red highlight. This is the first RX 7600S gaming laptop we've tested, and in this game at 1080p it's ahead of our powerful RTX 3060 laptops from last year and near lower powered 3070 Ti and 3080 Ti laptops. It's a fair bit higher than AMD's older RX 6700M, 6600M and 6800S. The 3070 and 3070 Ti laptops start coming out ahead at the higher 1440p resolution, but it's still a little ahead of the 3060 laptops, so somewhere in between. Red Dead Redemption 2 was tested with the game's benchmark, and this is a game that does better with Radeon graphics, which is why the 7600S is now closer to RTX 3070 Ti laptops with higher power limits like the Legion 5i Pro just above it. It's hitting 79 FPS at 1440p, though it's basically the same as last year's smaller Zephyrus G14 with 6800S. Still though, Razer's far more expensive Blade 15 with 3080 Ti is close by. Control on the other hand does better with Nvidia graphics, which is why a number of the RTX 3060 laptops were now ahead of the tough A16, though it's not too far behind. Same deal at 1440p. The higher powered 3060 laptops were ahead, so just goes to show that that it really depends on the specific game. Here are the 3D Mark results for those that find them useful. Now for some content creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark tool, and this test really does not do well for Radeon graphics, though I wasn't expecting to see it behind last gen options after seeing it ahead in the games. Adobe Photoshop likes single threaded performance, so the GPU matters less. It's doing fairly well considering the 7735HS is a essentially a 6800H, scoring 31% higher compared to last year's TOF. Though if I recall, that was limited to one memory stick. GPU power usually matters more in DaVinci Resolve, but this is another creator workload that I've found often favours Nvidia, though last year's TOF with RTX 3060 wasn't much better. Again, Radeon GPUs can't compete in Blender, with three good options for gaming way down the bottom in this test. We've also tested SpecViewPerf, which tests out various professional 3D workloads. The BIOS looks nice, but there aren't actually a whole lot of useful customization options available through here. If you're after tuning and tweaking, then you'll be better served by any MSI laptop, as their advanced BIOS gives you a crazy amount of customization. Linux support was tested with an Ubuntu 22.10 Live CD. By default, the touchpad, speakers, camera, ethernet, Wi-Fi, and keyboard shortcuts to change screen and keyboard keyboard brightness worked, but the Aura key does not let you change effects. Apart from the shortcuts, the laptop's keyboard didn't seem to work. I had to connect a USB keyboard to run my test commands. This is the bit where I would normally discuss pricing and availability, but right now I can only discuss one of those
those things, which is availability, because there isn't any. This thing has only just launched, so give it some time. But because I can't find it to buy anywhere, it means I've got no idea how much it costs. You'll have to check that link below the video for current prices once it's in stock. And if the A16 goes on sale, we'll be sure to add it to our gaminglaptop.deals website. We update it daily so you can get the best deal on your next gaming laptop. So check it out at gaminglaptop.deals. So then, is Asus's tough A16 a gaming laptop you should consider this year? In games, the RDNA 3 graphics were generally somewhere in between Nvidia's RTX 3060 and 3070 Ti, but it does depend on the game. Sometimes the 3060 could be ahead of the 7600S. It's worth considering that with the Radeon graphics in the A16, we can make use of FSR upscaling, while last year's older tough A15 with RTX 3060 graphics can use both FSR and also DLSS. And fact is, there are more games that support both of them than one of them. The A15 will also get refreshed this year with RTX 40 graphics options, which also means frame generation support in addition to DLSS. So basically just more features to help improve performance. If you're doing content creation work like video editing with Adobe Premiere, then personally I'd definitely stick to the Nvidia configuration. The Zen 3 Plus processor basically performs the same as others from 2022, but that would be different if you got the A16 with the newer Zen 4 processor. Both CPUs will be labelled as Ryzen 7000 models. You've really got to look at the third number to find out which architecture it's using. It really wouldn't surprise me if the new A16 ends up costing more money than last year's A15, simply because the A15 has been out longer and this is a new product. In that case, I'd probably just stick with last year's model. And like I said in my top 5 gaming laptops of 2022 video, the tough A15 is a great mid-range option. The 7600S can certainly be better in some games, but yeah, when it's worse in content creation and doesn't have other features like DLSS and frame generation, and worse battery life when running a game on the discrete graphics, I'm kind of sitting here wondering why I would pick the Radeon option. Battery life outside of gaming was still just as good as last year's A15. Thermals seem better in last year's A15 too. Granted, the fans in last year's model were like 7 decibels louder. Yeah, the CPU still thermal throttled at 95 degrees Celsius last year, but the CPU was running above 45 watts and hitting a 4 gigahertz all core clock speed while maintaining full GPU power. So more CPU performance than the newer A16. Unless a higher tier configuration with either Zen 4 CPU or higher tier 7700S graphics does better, last year's A15 is still an attractive option. Check out my full review of last year's tough A15 over here next. Again, I thought it was one of the best mid-range options available last year, and it's still got a lot to offer compared to the newer A16. So I'll see you in that one next.